everyone. Uh, it's a joy to be able to share uh, God's Word with all of you all today. Hopefully you are uh, doing well, hanging in there. Uh, we're continuing to make our way through the book of Exodus. We started a few weeks ago, and uh, last week we really saw this pivotal encounter that Moses has with God through the burning bush. Um, and through this encounter, Moses encounters, or Mo- Moses meets with the holy God who has drawn near. Right? This God who is utterly different from us in every way has drawn compassionately close. And so Moses has this amazing encounter with God. But on top of that, at the burning bush, Moses also receives his call from God. God calls him to go back to Egypt to rescue his people, the Israelites who are enslaved in Egypt, to draw them out of that land and to bring them into a promised land of their own. Uh, Now, uh, we might imagine that Moses would respond to such a call with excitement, Maybe with some conviction, right, and rush straight to Egypt to carry out what God has called him to do. After all, this is what he has imagined his life to be all about as he grew up in Egypt as an Egyptian prince. And furthermore, he just had this crazy encounter with God, the God of the universe, who showed up to him in this crazy way at the burning bush. We would imagine that Moses would be very excited to move forward with this call. But that's not how Moses responds. See, rather than being filled with excitement and and conviction— Moses is actually filled with a lot of fear and doubt. He doesn't want to go. In fact, he brings up all these objections to God as to why he should not go. He feels overwhelmed by what God is calling him to do. And and maybe we can relate to that as well. Maybe like Moses, we too can feel like God has called us to things that are just too much. Maybe God's called you to a, a particular family situation where it is overwhelming and you just don't want to do it. Maybe God's called you to a particular vocation, and it is stressful. Uh, maybe God's called you uh, to particular responsibilities, and, and it feels like it's, it's too much. Maybe God's led you into some difficult, challenging circumstances and seasons. Now, sometimes when God calls us, uh, we'd much rather not pick up the phone. And yet God does call. And very often, he does call us into situations and vocations and opportunities and relationships and seasons and circumstances that do overwhelm us. And so, how should we respond when God calls? Right? What's the appropriate response to the call of God on our lives? Well, that's what we're hoping to explore as we go through our passage for today. And so, if you have a Bible with you, if you want to turn with me to the book of Exodus. Exodus is the second book that we find in, in the entire Bible, so hopefully it's a little bit easy to find. Uh, but today, we'll be looking at Exodus chapter for the entire chapter, and as we kind of make our way through this chapter, we're going to see two major ways we are to respond to God's call in our lives, two ways we ought to answer the call of God, two things. And so uh, the first thing that we see here in our passage is that, number one, when God calls, we are to confidently trust in God's provision, confidently trust in God's provision. When God's call on our lives fill us with fear, with doubt, with anxiety, when it overwhelms us, We need to trust that God will graciously provide us with what we need to carry out his call. He will not leave us empty-handed, but whatever he calls us to, he will most certainly carry us through, right? And we see this in our passage. See, after God calls Moses to go back to Egypt, again, Moses brings up all kinds of objections and excuses. And we already saw some of these last week, right? When Moses asks God, who am I and who are you? Well, in this passage, in chapter 4, Moses just kind of ramps up the excuses to an even greater level. And we're going to see kind of three big excuses, three major objections that Moses brings up to God's call. And as we kind of run through them, uh, maybe we might recognize our own objections to God's call. But hopefully, even more than that, uh, hopefully we will recognize God's response and provision, even in light of our objections. And so, uh, first off, in response to God's call, uh, Moses objects on the grounds of him lacking the right credentials. God, I don't have the right credentials. He says to God that even if he were to go back to Egypt and tell the Israelites of this grand old plan to rescue them out of slavery, to confront the greatest empire known to human history by that point in time, the Israelites would never take him seriously. They'd just laugh at his face and tell him that he's crazy. I mean, imagine, like, here's this random old dude who has come wandering in from the desert. And you say, hey, God has met with me. He spoke to me. He's called me to lead you out of slavery. Trust me. Follow me. Like, no person in their right mind would choose to follow after such a guy. I mean, maybe if Moses was a general or or a politician, maybe if he had stuck around as an Egyptian prince, maybe then the people would believe him and he would have the right kind of credibility. But this just doesn't make sense. Moses is a nobody who's been gone for a long time. He doesn't have the right credentials. 
And so Moses is not sure if people would even be down to follow him, right? Take a look at what he says in Exodus 4.1. This is his first objection. I don't have the right credentials. He says this, then Moses answered. He's talking with God at this burning bush scene still. Then Moses answered, but behold, the Israelites will not believe me. They will not listen to my voice, for they will say, the Lord did not appear to you. How can we trust someone like you, Moses? Here, Moses really struggles to embrace his call because he feels like he lacks credibility. He he feels illegitimate in the eyes of others. He looks at his resume and he wonders if he can ever win the approval of his fellow Israelites. And maybe we can relate to that as well. And maybe we feel like we lack the right credentials because of our family background. We have all this family baggage that seems to kind of follow us wherever we go. And whenever people people bring that up, it kind of fills us with shame. Uh, Maybe we feel like we lack the right credibility we need because of our age. Maybe f- uh, for some of us, we, we feel like we're too young. And people say, hey, you're, you're too inexperienced, you're too naive, you're too idealistic. Or on the flip side, maybe we feel like we're, we're too old. And people say, hey, hey, you're past your prime. Hey, your best days are behind you, you're washed up, you don't have anything to contribute. Or maybe we feel like we lack the credibility we need because of our past failures. And maybe we feel like we're, we're only known for our mistakes and people will never see anything beyond that. Perhaps in these ways, we feel like we lack the right credentials. And so we feel afraid to step into God's call on our lives. But but here we see that God validates those whom he calls. See, after Moses brings up these objections, God grants him a series of three signs, three, three miraculous signs that he is to perform in front of the Israelites in order to validate, to authenticate that he has indeed been called by God to rescue them out of Egypt. And real quick, the first sign that Moses is to do is he is to take his staff and throw it on the ground. And when it hits the ground, his staff will turn into a snake. And when he picks it back up, it'll turn back into his staff. That's the first sign. Second sign, he's to put his hand inside of his cloak. When he puts his hand in his cloak, his hand will turn leprous. It'll become diseased. And then when he, take, uh, and then when he puts it back in again, his hand will become healthy again. That's sign number two. Last sign is to take water from the Nile River and pour it out on the ground. And when it hits the ground, it will turn into blood. Now, these signs are random to us. They, they seem strange to us. But, but these signs would have been deeply meaningful to the Israelites as they found themselves enslaved in Egypt. Because all three of these signs, the snake, the leprosy, uh, the Nile River, uh, all these three signs touched upon foundational things to life in Egypt. See, uh, the snake was uh, the royal symbol for for power in Egypt. Uh, Leprosy was a call out to the Egyptians' obsession with health and immortality. Uh, The Nile was the heartbeat of the entire Egyptian civilization. And so by carrying out these signs, Moses would be demonstrating God's authority over all the powers in Egypt. And furthermore, Moses would be validated in the eyes of these Israelites as someone whom God has called to indeed lead them out of Egypt. Now, as important as that is, I think in addition to that, I think God demonstrates, uh, God has these signs for Moses, not just for the Israelites' sake, but I think also for Moses' sake himself. It's not just that he worries that the Israelites uh, will reject him, but he himself doesn't feel confident in himself. Uh, I think God shows these signs to Moses for Moses' sake as well. See, with each sign, God takes something so ordinary, a staff, a cloak, some water, and God uses it for an extraordinary purpose. And by doing so, God is communicating to Moses that he does not need much to accomplish his kingdom purposes. Moses does not need to be a particular somebody because God can use anybody, even a nobody. Moses doesn't need to worry about securing the approval of others because he has already been approved by God. And likewise for us too, it's ultimately God who validates and affirms and authenticates our call, more than having the right kind of resume or having the proper kind of family background or or the prestigious education, having God's stamp of approval is the ultimate credential that we need to carry out his call on our lives. That's the first thing. Well, even with God's response and provision, Moses brings up another objection. And objection number two is that he says he is lacking special ability. This time Moses objects on the ground of him lacking special ability. Ability, Because after all, this role would require him to speak before the Israelites and to rally them in the face of the most powerful empire that they have ever known. And on top of that, this role would require him to confront Pharaoh with boldness, with conviction, but also with diplomatic tact. 
And so Moses thinks about what this job will require, and he says, hey, I don't have what it takes to do this job well. I lack special ability. I I don't have the oratorical ability to do what you're calling me to do, God. I I just don't have it. Take a look at Exodus chapter 4, verse 10, second objection. It says, but Moses said to the Lord, oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. Here, Moses struggles to embrace his call because he feels like he lacks special ability. Here, Moses claims that he is slow of speech, or literally, he is heavy of lips. Uh, Now, a lot of commentators kind of debate as to what exactly Moses is talking about. Some commentators think that Moses is referring to a lack of fluency in Egyptian, a lack of fluency maybe also in Hebrew because he's been gone for so long in Midian. Uh, other commentators think that he's, he's referring to just a lack of charismatic eloquence. Right? He doesn't have the ability to, to use his words to move the hearts of people. And still other commentators think that Moses is referring to, to an actual speech impediment, that he stammers or, or murmurs a, a lot, and so he has a hard time kind of speaking in front of people. But regardless of whatever specific issue Moses is referring to, all in all, Moses objects on the grounds that he lacks special ability to do what God has called him to do. And maybe we relate to that as well. And maybe at best, we kind of see ourselves as very average. I'm okay at this, I'm decent at that, but I'm not really excellent at anything. Or maybe on our more discouraged days, honestly, we feel like we literally have nothing to offer. I'm trash. I'm useless. I literally have nothing to give, nothing of value to provide. And on top of that, we can't help but to compare ourselves to others. Ah, man, I'm not smart like her. I'm not creative like him. I'm not bold like that person. I'm not charismatic like that other person. I'm just an ordinary person. What what use would God have someone, uh, what use would God have for someone like me? And we we object to God's call on our lives because we feel like we lack any special abilities. Well, that's what Moses does. But God reassures him that he doesn't need someone with unique talents or skills. He's not limited by our limitations. In fact, he can powerfully work through our weaknesses and shortcomings. See, God responds to Moses by asking him, hey, Moses, who made, uh, who made man's mouth? Like, who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Translation, Moses, don't you know that I'm the one who made your mouth? Don't you know that I already know that your speaking ability is not a surprise to me? I'm still calling you to go and speak before the people and before Pharaoh. And furthermore, I can work through your mouth. Your limitations do not limit me. In fact, my power is made perfect through your weakness. As the old saying goes, the only ability that God needs from us is availability. God can use and will use any of us with all of our deficiencies, all of our limitations, all of our shortcomings to carry out his call on our lives. So that's how he answers objection number two. Well, even with that response, Moses brings up one final objection. And this time, Moses objects on the grounds that he is lacking secure confidence. After all this this back and forth, Moses straight up says, God, I don't want to go. I know you've assured me of all these things, but... I don't want to go. Please call someone else. Right? Take a look at Exodus chapter 4, verse 13, the final objection that Moses brings up. He says this, but he said, oh, my Lord, please, please send someone else. Anybody else, not me. Please send someone else. Here, Moses struggles to embrace the call of God on his life because he lacks secure confidence. Even with all of God's reassurances, even with all of God's promises, even with all of God's provision, Moses prefers that God would send someone else. He thinks that someone else would be better suited for this job. Again, maybe we can relate to this. And maybe God has impressed certain needs upon your heart, certain things that that draw compassion out of you. But as you examine those needs and as you think about all that it will require of you to, to sacrifice to meet those needs... Maybe you think to yourself, ah, maybe someone else should step up. Maybe someone else should meet those needs. And maybe God has placed certain opportunities in your life, but, but you feel overwhelmed by those things. And so you think to yourself, man, maybe someone else who is smarter, more talented, more gifted, right, better than me, more experienced, maybe they should do it. 
And maybe God has called you to undertake a certain responsibility or a certain task, but, but you'd rather not. And so you avoid stepping into what God has called you to do by trying to push it off to someone else. Well, even as God has addressed all of Moses' fears and objections, Moses still asks God to send someone else. Anyone else, just not me, God. Well, to this objection, God actually gets angry. He actually gets angry with Moses. Now, God has been exceedingly patient with Moses in answering objection after objection, answering excuse after excuse. But here God says, that's enough, Moses. No more objections, no more excuses. Now, just as an important side note to, to, uh, to remark here, God's anger is not like our sinful anger, which is so often driven by frustration and impatience and selfishness. God's anger is not like that. Rather, God's anger is driven by his love. It's kind of uh, like the anger that you might feel if you saw a friend, a loved one, a family member kind of spiraling out of control into addiction. The reason why you're filled with anger is not so much because you hate that person, but rather it's because you love that person. Uh, you feel like they're, they're throwing their life down the drain. You, you, you want what's best for them. It's, it's an anger that is driven by love, and such it is with God's anger. God's anger is never a sinful anger, but it's always the expression of his love for his people. And here, God gets angry with Moses. Moses, that's enough. No more objections. No more excuses. But we see here that even as God is angry with Moses, God still mercifully meets Moses where he is at. He says, okay, Moses, if, if you're lacking confidence to go by yourself to Egypt, then I'll send someone else with you. I'm going to call your older brother Aaron, and he can speak on your behalf. But furthermore, not only is Aaron going to go with you, but I myself will go with you. Take the staff of God in your hand and let this be a reminder that you are never alone as you carry out this call on your life. See, where Moses lacks confidence and security, God provides all that Moses needs to carry out his call on his life. Now, so we've seen this interaction between God and Moses, that for every objection that Moses brings up, God responds by promising provision. And this whole interaction really boils down to God asking Moses, Moses, do you trust me? Do you trust that I'm not making a mistake in calling you to carry out this important task for the kingdom? Do you trust that I will provide exactly what you need in order to faithfully carry this out? Will you go simply trusting me? Will you go simply trusting me? See, I know that you feel like you don't have the right credentials, but I have validated you. I know you feel like you lack special ability, but I can work through you. I know that you don't feel very confident, but I will provide for you. Do you trust me? See, in many ways, answering the call of God on our lives boils down to this crucial question. Do you trust God? Do you trust in the God who has called you? And so if we want to rightly respond to God's call on our lives, we have to trust that God will provide all that we need to fulfill the calling he has placed on our lives. He will not send us out empty-handed, but whatever he calls us to, he will most certainly carry us through. We can trust in him. So we've seen the first half of how we can appropriately respond to God's call on our lives. Uh, but there's another part to rightly responding. And the second thing that we see here in our passage is that when God calls, we are to wholeheartedly obey God's commands wholeheartedly obey God's commands. When God calls, we're to follow through with what he has called us to do with a sincere commitment. We're to respond with wholehearted obedience to the call of God in our lives. And we see this here in our passage. See, as Moses moves forward with the, with the call of God, he's met with God in the wilderness and things seem to be moving forward. He goes back home, he packs up his stuff, he takes his family, his wife and his sons, and he starts making his way over to Egypt. But as he's making his way, something very strange happens as he's going over to Egypt. Uh, as things seem to be moving forward, a very strange incident takes place. It's definitely one of the weirdest stories in the book of Exodus, perhaps even in the entire Bible. Uh, let me just kind of read this for us and then unpack together what's happening here. If you skip down to Exodus chapter 4, verses 24 to 26, um, it says this. Uh, now, at a lodging place on the way, again, Moses is moving to Egypt. He's brought his wife, his sons. He's at a lodging place to rest. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. Then Zipporah, this is Moses' wife, then Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it and said, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. 
So he let him alone. It was then that she said, a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. All right, so this is a very strange story. If you grew up in the church, you've probably never heard this story in your, in your uh, children's ministry or, or whatnot. Very seemingly random story that kind of interrupts the flow of this narrative. Because again, after this encounter with God, it seems like Moses finally gets it. God's answered all of his objections. He's met all of his excuses. And now Moses is making his way to Egypt to fulfill God's call on his life. And as he's going, this strange thing happens where God meets him at this lodging place, and he's now seeking to kill Moses. Again, this is the guy that God himself has called to do his work in Egypt. Like, what in the world is going on here? Now, a lot of scholarly ink has been spilled on this passage over thousands of years, and so uh, there's not many definitive conclusions that that we can say, and that's partly because uh, the, the language, the wording in the original Hebrew is actually very vague. Uh, it's very obscure. But here are a few things that we can say about this passage, given the context. Uh, See, first, uh, God seems to be very angry with Moses because he has not circumcised his son. Now, we'll we'll talk about why that's such a big deal in just a moment. Uh, Secondly, uh, God incapacitates Moses so that he is knocking on death's door. We're not not told how, you know, Moses is, you know, facing death, but but it seems to be like he's he's right at the edge uh, of death. Now, God's aim here is not to harm Moses, but to teach Moses After all, because if God wanted to, he could have struck Moses down on the spot, but he doesn't do so. So God's not really aiming to to kill Moses here. Uh, Thirdly, Moses' wife, Zipporah, is somehow able to recognize that the reason why Moses is on his deathbed is because he has broken covenant with God. So she takes action, she circumcises their son, and that averts the crisis. Again, this is a very strange, strange story. But in it, I think we learn the importance of wholehearted obedience. See here, as Moses seeks to carry out God's call on his life, he needs to do so in line with God's commands. But sadly, he has failed to keep one of the most important commands that God has given to his covenant people, circumcision. See, uh, back in Genesis 17, just to give a little bit more background here, uh, when God makes a covenant with Abraham, who's the father of, uh, of these Israelites, when God makes a covenant with Abraham, God puts forward circumcision as a sign of that covenant. And it says in Genesis chapter 17, verses 10 through 11, this is God speaking to Abraham. He says, now this is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. So this, is, uh, this, this circumcision uh, is the sign of God's covenant between, between him and his people. Now, uh, circumcision, just a little bit more historical background. Circumcision was actually a pretty common practice in the ancient Near East during this time. Uh, Israel was not necessarily unique in that regard. But here's where they were unique. See, for other nations, for other cultures, circumcision was mostly a puberty rite that, that would signify fertility. And so very often, it would be when a guy was transitioning from childhood to manhood that he would be circumcised, and it would be a a symbol for him being ready to to bear children, ready to have children, ready to start a family of his own. Uh, But for Israel, it held a very different meaning. See, for Israel, circumcision was conducted on baby boys on the eighth day after their birth. And so as such, it was not a symbol for fertility, but it was a symbol of consecration. It was a symbol of dedication. It was symbolic for cutting away any other ties of allegiance and being fully devoted to God. As such, failure to undergo circumcision was equivalent to renouncing your own citizenship in the kingdom of God. That's why it says in Genesis chapter 17, verse 14, God tells Abraham, any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. See, God takes seriously this practice of circumcision as it relates to the covenant he has made with Israel. Now, here's what the irony is. God has called Moses to go and rescue his covenant people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But the problem is, as Moses is seeking to obey God, he has disobeyed one of the most important commandments that God has given to his covenant people. Even as he tries to rescue the covenant people of God, Moses himself has broken covenant with God. And that is quite the serious offense. See, by choosing to not circumcise his own son, Moses is in effect saying, hey, God, my son belongs to me. 
He doesn't belong to you. He, he belongs to me. Sure, you can call the shots on these lesser important parts of my life, where I live, what I do, what I do with my money, what I do with my time. You, yes, I'll give you authority over that. But on these most valuable things in my life, no, don't touch that. I'll obey you up to this point. I'll let you be God over these areas of my life, but you will come no further. See, Moses places conditional limitations on his obedience to God. He's drawn boundaries on where he'll let God be God. But the reality is, partial obedience, incomplete obedience, half-hearted obedience is actually disobedience. It's actually disobedience. Partial obedience is actually disobedience. Just to give a silly analogy, right? When you were a child and you were living with your parents, right, and they they told you, hey, I want you to clean up your room, like clean it all, and you only cleaned up half of it, guess what? You have not obeyed your parents. You've actually disobeyed them because partial obedience is disobedience. And God will not allow for such disobedience when it comes to carrying out his call. You know, sometimes when it comes to carrying out God's call on our lives, we'll say, okay, fine, I'll do it. But I'm going to do things my way. I'll obey you up to a certain point, but don't try to tell me what to do beyond this, right? I'm comfortable with this, but but don't move me beyond this. And we place certain limits on our obedience to God. Maybe God's called you to be a parent. He's given you this awesome responsibility to to train up, to disciple your children, to know Christ. And so you say, okay, sure, I'll point them to Jesus, but I'm also going to point them to all these other things that are equally as important. Right, as they see Christ, I want them to seek other things as well, just as much as they would seek Christ. And maybe God's called you into a particular career or vocation. He's given you opportunities to, to love your neighbors well through your job, to honor God well through your job. And you say, okay, fine, I'll do it. But if I want to climb to the top, if I want to excel at my job, then I got to do what everyone else is doing around me. I'm going to cut some corners so I can hit my quota. Right, you understand, right, God? And maybe God's called you to, to care for a loved one. And it's an avenue to demonstrate Christ's love to that person. But it's challenging. It's draining. It's overwhelming. And so maybe you allow yourself to give in to resentment and bitterness. And you say, okay, God, okay, I'll do it. I'll meet her needs. I'll take care of him. But I'm not going to do it with a joyful heart. Or maybe God's called you to pursue certain things that will advance his kingdom. And those things will require sacrifice. But you draw the line at certain things. You say, okay, God, I, I, will, I will sacrifice. But when it comes to my family, when it comes to my money, when it comes to my comforts, when it comes to my hopes, my dreams, my retirement plans, don't you dare touch those things because those things belong to me. We can delude ourselves into thinking that we are carrying out God's call on our lives with partial obedience, but in reality, we're living in disobedience because partial obedience is disobedience. You know, it's funny, I think so often, we can, we can think that the cost of obedience is so great, and it can be. God calls us to certain things that do require us to sacrifice, to give up our comforts, and the cost of obedience can be great. But here's the thing. The cost of disobedience is far greater. And the reason why the cost of disobedience is far greater is because when you disobey, you cut yourself off from experiencing God's call on your life. See, if Moses were to persist in his disobedience by refusing to circumcise his own son, he will not experience the call of God on his life. He will not be able to experience God doing wonderful, uh, miraculous things in Egypt. He will not be able to experience God leading the Israelites out of slavery from Egypt. He will not be able to experience crossing through the Red Sea. He will not be able to experience God's glory descending on Mount Sinai. He will not be able to experience the receiving of the law. He will not be able to experience all these things. He will not be able to experience leading the people into the promised land. Yes, while the cost of obedience obedience may be great, the cost of disobedience is far greater. We cut ourselves off from experiencing the call of God on our lives. See, God calls us into obedience for our joy, but disobedience forfeits that joy. But thankfully, God offers us grace when we do fall into disobedience. See, our disobedience does not have to be our disqualification. And we see that with Zipporah. Man, she's the MVP of the story right here. After Zipporah, Moses' wife wisely discerns what's happening here. As she takes decisive action to circumcise their son, God relents. Moses' life is spared and his call is restored. See, there is grace available for us 
even when we fall into disobedience. And this act of circumcision actually points ahead to a greater grace that is ultimately made available for us in Christ. I see Moses was shed, uh, Moses was saved rather by the shedding of blood from a son that brought him into right covenantal standing with God. Now, is that not a picture of the gospel itself? See, many, many, many generations later, God would send his own son to shed his own blood on the cross in order to bring sinners into right covenantal standing with him in a newer and better covenant. And just like circumcision, which is bloody, gruesome, and kind of strange, the cross is bloody, gruesome, and kind of strange. And yet, it is ultimately God's gracious provision for his covenant people. See, where we fail in our disobedience, God restores us by his grace. And with newfound grace, we can faithfully carry out God's call on our lives with wholehearted obedience. So we've seen that the appropriate response to God's call in our lives is to confidently trust in God's provision and to wholeheartedly obey God's commands. So when God calls us, instead of running away in, in fear or in seeking to do things, cut corners by doing things our own way, the right response is to trust and obey. After all, this is the very way of Jesus who perfectly demonstrates what it looks like to respond to God's call with, with trust and with obedience. All right, 1 Peter chapter 2 tells us that when Jesus was reviled, he chose not to revile in return, but instead he entrusted himself to the God who judges justly. I have confident trust in you, God. When Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's wrestling with God. God, will you please take this cup from me? He demonstrates wholehearted obedience by saying, yet not my will, but your will be done. Jesus perfectly demonstrates what it looks like to rightly respond to God's call, to trust and obey. And that itself is the application for today's sermon. But if I can just add one more application in light of our passage, that is to carry out God's call with the support of community. Carry out God's call with the support of community. See, while our calls can be very personal, they are never meant to be private. They're never meant to be carried out alone. Uh, even for Moses, while he, has, uh, while, he was called upon, uh, while he was called upon by God to take on a very unique role in this plan of redemption for Israel, this burden was not meant for him to carry out alone. Rather, God provides for him Aaron, who goes with him. He provides for him Zipporah, who rescues him. God provides community to help Moses carry out his calling. Community and calling are never meant to be separate from each other, but they're to go hand in hand. So community helps us to faithfully carry out the call of God on our lives because it strengthens our faith so that we can trust God when we're prone to waver or run off. Community provides accountability and support so that we can wholeheartedly obey God when we're tempted to settle for partial obedience. Community is God's gracious gift to us as we seek to carry out his call on our lives. Um, and for me personally, I, I'm coming to realize uh, the importance of community when it comes to calling. Uh, if you know me, uh, I, I, I pride myself on being a very self-sufficient person. I don't like asking for help and I don't like receiving help. But I'm realizing all the more and more, especially with this upcoming move off OMC's campus, that God's call is never meant to be carried out alone. Uh, this whole experience ha has really overwhelmed me, if I'm honest. Um, I never imagined myself to be a church planter, someone who starts a new church out there, uh, because I don't fit the mold of the typical church planter. I, I don't have the entrepreneurial spirit. I'm not a charismatic personality. I don't have great vision. I don't have grand plans for us, right? It's hard for me to even figure out where we're going to be next month. I like stability. I like being in the background. I like being comfortable. And so as God has made it clearer and clearer that he's leading us off campus into this new season of ministry together, honestly, I've given all the same excuses as Moses himself, right? Lord, I don't have the right credentials. I'm too young. I'm too inexperienced. I've only been in this church my entire life. I don't know what it's like out there. Like, am I the right person for this job? I, I, I've said, Lord, I, I don't have any special abilities. I'm a pretty average pastor. Uh, there's so many better preachers than me out there, so many better leaders than me out there. I'm pretty middle of the road. Like, wouldn't someone else be a better fit for this? I said, Lord, I, I don't have secure confidence. I'm a planner to the T. I love to know exactly what's going to happen. And so it's bothered me to no end, realizing I don't know what's going to happen. What if we crash and burn? Sure, people might be excited initially to move off campus, but will they stay? 
will we survive? Will we be able to make it? I've seriously wrestled with this role that I find myself in, and I've often contemplated if, if this is just a fool's errand. But what has kept me going is God's grace particularly poured out on me through this community. Over the past six months, I've received more encouragement than I can keep count of. Text messages, emails, phone calls, visitations, people just reminding me of God's faithfulness. I've been the recipient of countless prayers, so many people who have prayed for me, for Jen, for Caleb, for this whole process. I've seen people step up to serve in all kinds of ways. I've seen God stir conviction and excitement in the hearts of others. I've been reminded of God's ongoing faithfulness through this church. There's no way I would be doing this apart from God's grace shown to me through this church. And I'm reminded again and again that God's call is never separate from God's community. As a family chapel, as we seek to faithfully carry out the call of God on our lives as as parents, as employees, as friends, as, as neighbors, as students, in all the various ways that God has called us, would we support one another, encourage one another, pray for one another, rebuke one another, challenge one another, do this together, because God's call and God's community always go hand in hand. Let's do this so that, when, so that when God calls, we would help each other respond by confidently trusting in God's provision, and by wholeheartedly obeying God's commands. Bow your heads with me at this time. Spend some time in prayer and reflection as we respond to God's word together. Um, Church, would you just take this time to to simply say yes? Simply say yes to God. To say yes to his call on your life. To say yes to his invitation to trust, to obey. Would you ask God for the grace and support from community to to faithfully carry out what God has called you to do. And as you do that, would you also pray for the people around you, people who may be struggling to carry out God's call in their lives? Would you be their support? Would you be their encouragement? Would you be their prayer partner? Would you be their reminder of God's faithfulness that they too can trust God and obey God? Let's take a moment to respond to God's word together as we spend some time in prayer. Let's pray.